Hi, I'm Mary Marinville, Ag Education Coordinator in Ventura County, and welcome to my Ventura County Sustainable Farmer of the Month. I'm here in Agricultural Heartland in Ventura County in Camarillo, California, and I'm here with Casey Howlings, the president of Howlings Nurseries. Hi, Casey. How are you today? Hi, great. Great. I um. I know that you have a long family history with agriculture. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of Howling's Nursery and your family connections? Sure. Well, um, it's, it goes way back to Holland where, when my dad grew up over there, and he actually was from a non-farming uh, family. Okay. But he had it in his blood, and he, worked, uh, he got an education there, and he worked in a research station. But after the Second World War, uh, they moved to Canada, and uh, I ended up in Vancouver, and that's the family I was born in. I'm actually Canadian, so uh, he started there in floral operations, and basically, to put a long story short, it evolved uh, to a point where I was ended up growing vegetables, uh, primarily tomatoes, and then it just grew from there to where it is today. Uh, the, my uh, father has long since passed away, but and the company no longer does floral. So we've concentrated on uh, on growing tomatoes, and basically that's what we do, and that's what we do best. Great. So you were from Holland. Did did you grow tulips? I wasn't from Holland, actually. I was born in Canada. My dad was. Um, but he was uh, born in Rotterdam, okay. and his dad actually had a transport company. So he does, he does not actually have agricultural roots. So he moved into agriculture, and uh, that's... I guess that's how it all started. Not sometimes uh, you do get the rarity where a city person actually goes into ag. Oh, great, great. I grew up on a working farm in upstate New York, and I have so many fond memories associated with agriculture, like running through the cornfields. As a child, do you have any memories um, going into your dad's business and with agriculture? Well, there's. I mean, it starts out at the very bottom end of things. That sometimes you remember things for. Uh, for reasons I don't know why, I still remember as being a very little, uh, a, a little kid where, where uh, we were working in the vegetable, uh, in the vegetable garden, and I was with my dad, and I, and I I remember this clear as day today is that is this a weed or is this a carrot? Is this a weed or is this a carrot? And I had it figured out pretty quickly after that, and I guess maybe that's where the seeds got sown and. Uh, just seeing it in the little vegetable garden and today obviously it's a whole lot different than it was then there's been a lot of evolution within the business and a lot of more technology and everything else but essentially it's still that growing something that's in your blood and that's what separates a good farmer from a bad farmer it's got to be in your blood exactly and i and i know that and that's why i wanted to ask the question because to go from um, from that to being what you have, what you, where you are today, there, it must be a deep, deep passion. And I just wanted to know if that was there from when you were a child, and obviously it was. All right, thank you. And now we're going to move from the agricultural field into a Howling's greenhouse. Now I'm with Casey inside one of his amazing hot houses, and I'll never forget the first time I got a tour at Howling's Nurseries. I was in awe and uh, and just in amazement of this operation. And the tomatoes are about 30 feet high. And uh, before I ask Casey my next question, I just wanted him to explain why we have to wear these white suits. All right. The part of it is hygiene. You look at a facility like this, we do everything we can to prevent bugs from getting in, to prevent these diseases, so we don't have to use pesticides or fungicides or any of those other kind of things. So that, first of all, is a prevention me measure. And because this is an agricultural area and there's no winter kill, so you have a lot of pest pressures here. The further south you go, the more pest pressures you get. I often compare it to uh, just a bug is bad. But a bug that carries a virus is much worse. Like a mosquito bites one thing, but a mosquito that carries malaria is a whole other difference. And in ag, you have tons of viruses that are vectored and carried by bugs. 
and other diseases. We don't want them in this greenhouse. To give you an example, if we get a disease in here and it affects the crop, we have to pull the complete crop out, replant it, and in this 20-acre facility, that's a $2 million bill. So there's a lot of incentive here to keep it out. There's also a lot of incentive in our operation to minimize the amounts of pesticides or any other chemicals that none of us really want to use to, uh, I mean, ultimately our goal is to not have it at all. And uh, that's what we work awfully hard on. So that's why you have to take some of these preventive uh, measures to try and make sure that whatever's, whatever is a potential uh, uh, way of getting any diseases in has been taken care of and mitigated. Mm -hmm. And if nothing else, it's a good conversation piece. Um, I'm looking around and all I can see is tomatoes that way and tomatoes that way and it's it's just amazing. How many acres in Ventura County do you have under glass? Well this uh, right here we have 125 acres of greenhouses that grow tomatoes in a facility like this. Up in Canada we have another uh, 50 acres. So this is uh, this is by far our largest uh, single operation here. 125 acres under glass. And what do you grow? What crops do you grow? Well, we grow almost every tomato you can think of. We start at grapes, and then we go to a cocktail, cocktail which is a little, uh, little bigger fruit. And then we have a strawberry tomato, which tastes really, uh, it's a very sweet tomato, probably one of our best tasting tomatoes. And then we move up to Roma, uh, to regular tomatoes on the vine, which is which is where we're in right now. This is tomatoes on the vine. You'll find these in your in uh, local uh, supermarkets. Probably the main the main staple of the greenhouse industry. And then we finish off with a beef tomato, which is a bigger tomato that people will use for hamburgers or whatever else. So basically, if there's a type of tomato, we grow it, including yellow and orange. Mm -hmm. Do you grow cucumbers as well? We have a few cucumbers here also because some of our uh, customers have. have requested that we do that so but primarily our basis really is tomatoes we really are uh, uh, tomato specialist and that's what we pride ourselves in doing best well I know that I became a believer I wasn't sold on greenhouse tomatoes at first and when I came here the first time on my tour I was given a tomato and it was probably one of the best tomatoes I've ever tasted and I'm not just saying that and I was thoroughly impressed and uh, can you tell us about hydroponic growing and the quality of your tomatoes? Well basically uh, when you think of the way we grow uh, we we minimized any of the outside exposures that you can have when you grow outside so no rain uh, no dust, no wind, and, and the bugs and everything else that I already talked a little bit about. So what this is about, this is about consistency. Trying to get the best possible climate you can and creating a, uh, a nirvana for a plant so that they can do everything they do best. Anytime there's stress on a plant, it slows the growth and it affects the quality and everything else. So we have perfected it. To, there's not a lot of research into doing what we're doing and you know from all the way from controlling uh, humidity to CO2 to temperatures and how you grow and how you grow counter cyclicals because it's not really it's not natural to grow a tomato 12 months out of the year and be in production all the time in spite of the fact it might be on the on the store shelves you cannot grow a tomato outside through the winter time even here in, in Ventura County so this gives you the opportunity to actually grow the food closer to where uh, the consumer is mm -hmm. and it uh, it also gives you the ability to be uh, non-seasonal and have consistent quality product. Mm -hmm. I love going into my local producer, my local farmers uh, market in the winter time and, and getting um, fresh tomatoes so we do appreciate you growing them all year and earlier when you were talking about quality you were talking about locally grown agriculture and produce and how important that is and in relation to quality. Could you talk to us about the locally grown? Well, local is a big issue for, for any food because we're not producing wine. Wine gets better with age, produce doesn't get better with age. So the best tomato you, the, the best tomato you can get is one that's fresh off the vine, that's ripened on the vine. But because we have to go through chain management and you have cooling and everything else, every day that tomato doesn't get eaten, it tastes a little less. So it's important for, from a handling perspective, never put a tomato in, in a fridge. Because when a tomato goes below uh, 55 degrees, it loses flavor. 
So that, you know, and, and that depends all the way through the chain. Uh, but we need to produce a tomato that has two weeks of shelf life. So there's those are the kind of barriers that you have to have too to be able to get it to the consumer so it's still good and quality tomato at the consumer stage. Our job really isn't done until the consumer gets it and eats it. And they are delicious. Um, right now in agriculture, the word sustainable and sustainability gets thrown around a lot. And I know um, through educating myself that Howlings doesn't just talk to talk, you walk the walk. And what practices do you follow as far as sustainability uh, in agriculture? Well, we've we've done a whole a number of my rate things, and it's it's almost it's it's a passion of our company also. What can we do, and leave as small a footprint on the environment, and not only do it because it makes sense, but do it because we want to leave a world behind for our kids. And uh, so we've really that it's it's just ingrained into our culture so wherever we can we, we minimize the amount of energy use we have solar panels here to generate electricity uh, we research all our water we treat our uh, there's no waste ag runoff we collect the rain off the roof for irrigation purposes so we minimize the water use we minimize the amount of land we use this for, for example this is on 160 acres of land produces the, uh, the equivalent of about 7,000 acres of field tomatoes that is amazing from farm gate value. So that means that you're you're leaving a lot of land over for other purposes. And whether that's any, anywhere from recreational to uh, growing different crops to cotton or whatever else it is, is this is just a great use of land and it minimizes our imports because it's year round. So it's it's a it's a job creator for uh, for the community. It's uh, so it has economic benefits certainly to be close by and the closer you are the less pressure that's on the environment from transportation needs and uh, the, the diesel fuel used to truck stuff across produce is transported a long distances and our goal really is, is to minimize it. Why should people in Los Angeles be eating a tomato in the winter that comes all the way from southern Mexico? We shouldn't be. I agree. I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> so, But in order to do that, that means you have to produce it those times of the year. So we try and do, we try and cover up a lot of the things we do and we're very proud of what we do. You should be. And back to the land use issue. So in hydroponic you're not growing horizontally so to speak. You're growing vertically. And can you explain what we're seeing right here? Could you um, explain how hydroponic works? Well basically um, a plant needs nutrients to grow. Mm -hmm. And these these nutrients are fertilizers. Mm -hmm. So the plant gets everything it needs all the way from boron to molybdenum to iron to uh, nitrogen phosphorus uh, potassium to, just to name a few a plant can't live without those it's, it's in a lot of ways it's a similar to a human being where you need the vitamins so we feed the plant those fertilizers what we would call fertilizer and it goes in and we feed it to them as they use it. We have a computerized system that measures the amount of light and the transpiration and, and everything else. And you're feeding them through these tubes right here? Yes, so th this is basically the uh, the nutrient tube where it's not on right now, but whenever the computer says a plant needs, some, needs more water and more nutrients, on it goes and it gives every plant a very consistent same amount. Mm -hmm. So the um, this is right here, this is actually a rock hole block. Mm -hmm. And it, it just looks like, it's just, uh, a base it's made out of basalt rock and that's to hold the nutrients in it for where we uh, mm -hmm. we start these plants up in our Canadian facility they're all grafted every plant is grafted you can see the ring right here still mm -hmm. and this is basically uh, the plant we ship it up from Canada and it comes up on here and and this is where this is where the roots grow and this is where it takes the nutrients out out of the water and and it transports it up to the stem brings it up to the leaves and uh, there it goes through the process of photosynthesis and change it into sugars mm -hmm. and then the sugars get used to grow the tomatoes actually so uh, the the starches sorry and and uh, gets transferred into what you'd see tomatoes leaves or or whatever else it is oh it's so beautiful and it looks very science uh fictionist almost when you really get up close and and see just the small amount of area that it takes to grow these beautiful plants um in in um, closing, um, I know that ag education is very important to you. What do you want to pass on to the kids and, 
in Ventura County and to the next generation. Well, I think the very first thing to do is when you eat something, think about what it is. And consider that it's nutrients for your body. That's what you live off of. And you can take vitamins and all this other stuff, but it's never a replacement for the real thing. So you, you think about the quality of the product you're putting into your into your body and what you're what you're growing from and how healthy you want to be and uh, and then you also want to think about well where does this come from does it come from close and uh, they had to ship it halfway across the uh, the world and what's kind of uh, footprint is it leaving behind for uh, when you grow up and when when uh, you're out there so it's uh, food we don't think about near enough we want our kids to start thinking about food and to start thinking about what they're putting into their bodies because the health care costs and everything else that we all got to worry about it's very important it starts starts young the habits are built when you're a kid right and farming isn't um, exactly what it used to be as you can see from howlings it's a highly technical science-based industry it is about food and it is about farming that's where the heart of it is but it's uh there's many opportunities available also in agriculture to the next generation um can you talk about some of the careers science-based careers that are available here well there's uh the way we grow farming today is so much different you know it's not about driving a tractor in a facility like this it's all the way from computerization to systems to mechanization of uh, of how equipment works to to having a grower to figure out what should the humidity be what should the temperature be what do i need to do now to uh, to people that deal with the bug situations the disease uh, issues uh, uh, all the way from the construction phase to uh, the sales end of it i mean it there is so many different facets in this business. My daughter, Marketing and sales. My, my daughter is uh, just finished school and she's going to join the company uh, in September. And the first thing I'm going to do is, is get her to work in every different facet of the business. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a huge, uh, going to be a big learning curve for her. And at the end of the day, when she's done, it'll take her about two and a half years to make it through two months in every different department. Mm -hmm. And she'll have a good overview. Is this something I want to do? And if she doesn't have the passion for it, then maybe she should find something that she does want a passion for. It. But I believe there's there's a it's it's a great business. I mean, I love it obviously, and and I think there's it's not for everyone, but it uh, certainly is. If if it's a passion of yourself, uh, I would you know follow a career, mm -hmm. do something you love. And we're all connected to agriculture. I love when I ask kids the question of who's connected to agriculture and no one raises their hand. And I say, well, you, do you all eat? And they say, yes. And I said, then you're all con we're all connected to agriculture. And I think we forget that sometimes. So can I um, take one of these tomatoes and eat it? Uh, why, of course you could. <laughs> thank you, Casey. And uh, thank you, Ventura County. So here's an example of a city boy. Grew up in downtown LA in Watts. Yeah, I know that's Inglewood. <laughs> yeah. Where'd you grow up? Pasadena. Oh, that's a city. Yeah. I love Pasadena. It's too hot there. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's not good for uh, the sun. And you're always interested in agriculture? Uh, my family was, uh, let's see, my grandparents and that side of the family was in agriculture. Oh. And my, my father, I think they had enough. <laughs> my father worked for like JPL, NASA, oh. and he's all, all about computers and, uh, and space programming and all that stuff. So it just skipped a generation? It skipped a generation. But I guess if you go back far enough, it used to be like 90% 90, 90 of the population used to work on farms. Yep. yep. You know, back to the old days. Well, old days, not that long ago. Even, even 100, 100 years ago, turn of the century. Yeah. Turn of the century was still like that. Probably 70% was still in. You know, isn't that amazing how things have changed in just 100 years? It's scary. 
well, but yeah, the world has changed more in the last hundred years than it has in the, the last end. thousands. Sure, thousands, really, when you think about it. coming around. Thank you. 